Welcome to 502 Conversations. I'm Brian Kirby, and my guest today is Dr. James Alcock from York University in Toronto. I have quite a biography on you, so I'd like to read it just so I don't mess things up. And I, I do know it, but I, I want to get things straight. Is that all right? It's fine. Do you mind? <laughs> no. So Dr. Alcock has a PhD in psychology and teaches at York University in Toronto. And his research interests are focused on belief, and in particular, on why people believe in things that have no scientific basis. A noted critic of parapsychology, he is a fellow of the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry and also on the editorial board. You have received CSI's highest award, the In Praise of Reason Award, and you are a fellow of the Canadian Psychological Association. And at the time, the quote for you was for a distinguished, sorry, a distinguished contribution to the advancement of the science or profession of psychology. And you are an expert on belief. Yes. And that's what you teach about, yes. correct? Yes. All right, so I have a script here, and I didn't follow it last year. I'm going to try and stick to it this year. I do get sidetracked, and I apologize. <laughs> well, uh, if you say something I don't understand, I might interrupt you and ask sure, for clarification. Sure, that's not a problem. So, um, get right at it? Sure. All right. And do you prefer to be referred to as professor, doctor, or? Jim. Jim? Oh, yeah, well, thank if, you. If you could be that informal on in your program, oh, that's Oh, I fine. don't mind at all, but I think... I, I've mistakenly done that before, so I didn't want to be too, okay. uh, too informal. Right. Okay, so the first question I have for you, and I scripted it, is how do we know things? And what is the difference between belief and knowledge? And along with that, when does belief become knowledge? And I want to tell you a brief anecdote about myself. Um, when I was a small child, I lived in northern Maine. It was cold, and I'm talking grade school, first, second grade, I don't remember when. But I asked my mother, why does Napoleon, I'd seen a picture of Napoleon with his hand in his shirt, and I said, why does he do that? And my mother replied, because his long underwear itched, which made sense to me because I'm from Maine, we always wore long underwear in the wintertime. I get to third grade, the third grade teacher asks the question, I raise my hand, think I know the answer, and I say, because his long underwear itched. And the class laughs, the teacher scowled at me, and I was really confused because my mother told me that. And so I believed I had acquired some knowledge. In retrospect, I kind of assume she didn't know and she made something up. Um, another thing that adults in my community might have done would, if they didn't know something, would say, don't ask such foolish questions if they didn't know the answer. So I thought I knew something, but I didn't. I believed something. Where did I go wrong? Well, this is the, this is the, the problem, isn't it? This is humanity's problem, trying to understand what is reality and what is just our interpretation of reality. And so, so belief is our understanding of a situation. It involves two things. One, the content, and two, a level of conviction. So you can have content. Uh, you know what Santa Claus is like. You could draw a picture of him. You could tell us all about where he goes on Christmas Eve and so forth. But your level of conviction that's true is probably zero. Oh. So, so there's a, 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 a belief with no conviction attached to it. You could believe with 100% certainty that Washington, D.C. is the capital of the United States. Uh, if someone were to ask you what's the capital of New York State, you might say, well, I, I believe it's Albany, but you're not quite sure. So you might, if you had to assess it, say, well, my conviction rate or my conviction level is 80%. So belief varies depending on how persuaded we are that something is true. But when it comes to what is knowledge, and this is a philosophical question, it's not really a psychological one. Oh. So, for example, Plato, Plato said that uh, for something to be knowledge, for you to know something, first of all, it had to be true. Secondly, you had to believe it to be true. And thirdly, you had to have a good rational basis for believing it was true. So even if it were true and you believed it was true, but you didn't have a justification, you didn't have evidence, to play to that wouldn't have been knowledge. And so philosophers have talked about this concept of knowledge over, over the millennia. But to a psychologist, that's not really too important because ultimately our perception of the world is interior, it's in our heads. And we sort of collectively decide what is, what is the the best interpretation that suits reality. And so, for instance, at one time, scholars, the most intelligent people in, in the land, believed that there were witches. And they had lots of apparent evidence for that. But we now know that these witches didn't have them, witches didn't exist in the sense that they thought they existed, that they were in league with the devil, they, they rode on broomsticks and so forth. So ultimately, when you say, uh, when, when Plato says, well, it has to be true, that's the big question for psychologists. How do we ever know anything is true? And all we re really ever can do is sort of approach that truth by sort of converging with evidence in various directions. And ultimately, it's sort of consensual. We, we, we agree amongst ourselves that it's true. 
So si science is a very codified uh, approach to trying to, 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 to get to the truth of something and eliminate error. But, but, but any scientist, any good scientist would say, look, I can't prove anything ultimately. All I can do is tell you, given the evidence at hand, what is the best interpretation of this time? And with advancements in knowledge, we get closer and closer to what ultimately probably is the truth. The, and then we have, I suppose, knowledge, if you want. So b a belief is far from knowledge, then, or it can be far from well, knowledge. Well, uh, to a psychologist, I, I don't even like that distinction. OK. Right? It's a philosophical one. It is, OK. Right? So, so I never use the term knowledge when I'm, when I'm talking about beliefs. And I simply talk about, again, the content of the belief and the degree of conviction. So, so for me and my mother, it was true for me for quite a while. Well, that you believed it to be true. I did. Right? In, in the same way that, uh, you, you know, scientists themselves have had, uh, as a collective body, have had erroneous beliefs over the years. Everyone believed it was true. There seemed to be evidence. Everyone believed, for example, in the Piltdown hoax. The, 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 the uh, anthropologists yes. and so forth believed this was true. It turns out 50 years later, it's discovered that it's a hoax. So th their belief was in error, but at the time, no one knew that at the time. They had no apparent way of, of, of determining that. I mean, it was, they accepted the evidence they had. And evidence is subject to being overturned or uh, better evidence revealed, I guess. That's right. We're always, we're always trying to. I mean, everything, our whole experience of the world exists inside our heads. Right? We, don't, we, don't, we don't see reality. We, we translate incoming wavelengths of light and incoming ripples of, of uh, uh, vibration in the air we translate those into sights and sounds, and we, we try our best to make sense of them. And then we compare ourselves with other people and see, are, are they getting the same interpretations? So we sort of struggle, and it's taken humanity thousands of years to get to a point where we at least now, in science, have, have, a, have a, a fairly rigorous way of, of trying to determine whose interpretation, which interpretation is correct. But, but even now, I mean, there, there are papers that are published that are either in great error or, or they're even fake, right? There have been some, some papers uh, that have had to be recalled from prestigious journals because they were, they were falsified. But presumably people believed them at the time because they were in prestigious journals. So, so I think to a scientist, to a psychologist, there's no such thing as absolute, uh, there, there's absolute reality, but, uh, but our sense of it, our understanding of it is always in some ways going to be short of the mark because we are always essentially sending out our probes yeah. and trying to understand what's out there, and that's an imperfect process. All right, so I shouldn't be too hard on my dear old mom. No. <laughs> okay, good. I, sorry, I sort of got off script there, but I'll go right back to it. Um, this goes right into it. Um, I accepted that based on authority. She was smarter than myself. Right. And when I was thinking about the questions to ask you, I realized that a lot of the knowledge I have, I'm, I'm sorry to intermix, Belief right, and sure. knowledge, but a lot of the knowledge that I think I have, I have accepted on authority, things that I don't know, that I can't prove. I, I doubt I could prove to you that 2 plus 2 equals 2. I couldn't prove it mathematically. I could probably get four beans. It actually equals four. Oh, what did I say? <laughs> oh, good. Thank you for that. Oh, I was wrong all this time. Right. Sorry. 2 plus 2 equals 4. Right. I could do that with some beans here, right. but I couldn't prove it mathematically. I accept all kinds of things uh, through school that I just had to accept gravity and... Um, things that I know work because I see them working, but I can't tell you how they work. So does that mean I really know how no, they work? No, I think we have to accept things in authority. Uh, you know, civilization has for thousands of years been accumulating bits and pieces of information. We, we don't have time to go out and, and do it all on our own. So I always challenge my students to uh, persuade me that the earth is a globe. And uh, I say, you know, years ago, centuries ago, people thought it was flat. I, I come from Saskatchewan where everything is flat. Yeah. So I said, for me to believe it's a globe is stretching things. I don't see any signs of it. And of course, students will say, well, that's, that's silly. You know, you get up in an airplane and you, you go from Toronto to Paris. I mean, obviously, you've gone around the globe. I said, no, that could be perfectly flat. Well, what about going around the world? I said, has anyone done that? No, they haven't. Uh, and then they get frustrated. They, and someone always comes up with this, this story that I was told as a kid by a teacher. If you sit on a dock by the ocean and watch a three-masted schooner go over the horizon, the, 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 the hulk of the ship disappears first and the top mast, the top right. flag goes down last. And they'll say, that proves it. I said, have you ever done that? No, they never have done it. And so they get frustrated. And my point to them is, you have to accept that in authority. 
you, you, uh, you have to accept, you mentioned gravity, for example. Another good example, people take that term gravity to explain things, but, but in, in, in physics, gravity is an extremely complicated concept. I mean, Einstein described gravity as the result of empty space being curved. But to, to, to everyone else, to the layperson, gravity just means you drop, you hold something out, it falls to the yeah, floor. Right. Um, and it always works. And it always works. But the fact is, we all have gravitational fields. You're, you're pulling the floor towards you, it's pulling you towards it. The Earth's a lot bigger than you are, so it has a greater gravitational pull on you. But, but the, the ordinary, you know, the layperson says, I understand gravity because I let go of this and it drops. But they don't understand it, they're putting a label on it. It reminds me of a, of a story I once heard Isaac Asimov tell. He said that when he was a child, he was in, in, in Russia, his father had taken him out in the woods one day, and they said, this is a maple tree, and this is an oak tree, and this is an elm tree, and that's a hickory tree. And that evening, his father said, so Isaac, what, what did you learn today when we were out in the woods? He said, oh, I learned all, of, all about trees. Well, what did you learn about trees? Well, I learned which is a maple, and which is an oak, and which is an elm. He said, my father said to me, you didn't learn anything about trees. You just learned labels for them. You learned names. That doesn't tell you anything about trees. I think that's, that's what we have to be careful of, that we often take labels, gravity, as though we explain it. And it's not a, in the same way that people will say, well, I don't know how my friend was thinking that when I was thinking at the same time. It must be ESP. Now they've assigned a label as though they've explained it. They haven't explained anything. They've used, used a label. So... <laughs> I guess I understand we can't do everything ourselves. No. You can't fix your, well, some people can fix their own cars, but they don't have time, so they go to an expert on it. But they, even they people who fix their own cars have probably uh, learned from some authority. Right. right. It may have been their father when they were kids. It may have been uh, re reading a book. It's very rare for a person who has never done anything with motor mechanics to take an engine apart and put it back together, right? I mean, and even that wouldn't explain how an internal combustion no. engine actually works, no. would it? No. Wow. So, trust authority. But sometimes authority can go haywire. And that's the problem. Intentionally, and then, the, and then there becomes, you know, there's a movement to say, oh, you can't trust anybody anymore for some reason. So, I, as a university professor, I guess this has, is sometimes an issue where professors impart wisdom that they maybe shouldn't. Um, and people accept that based on authority. I don't know, it could be a political belief, it could be um, socio, uh, a social belief or something like that. And do you find that it's easier to, maybe, I'm not sure you have done this, but do your students challenge you regularly? Well, what I tell students is that the most important thing is for them to learn how to think in a critical way. And that, that means uh, not accepting authority blindly. But if you don't accept authority at all, then you're, you're going to be in a pickle. <laughs> so for example, take the, take the, uh, the, the um, um, beginning of the universe. So if you're, if you're a, a born again Christian, you have the authority of the Bible. And uh, people have worked out apparently that the God created the world about 6,000 years ago. If you are, 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 are not that, uh, that way oriented, but you, you are scientifically oriented, you will undoubtedly believe the Earth is about, I think it's, what, 13 billion years old? It began with the Big Bang and the singularity. Well, um, that's what I happen to believe, but I'm accepting that in authority. I, I don't have the means to, to test that myself, to test that notion. And, and that's true of just about everything I know. That, that, so it becomes a matter of choosing your authorities. And that's what I tried to get students to focus on, choosing their authorities. And I will say to them, uh, I'm doing my best to tell you what I think is, is, is correct, but that isn't the basis for believing it. You know, if, if I say something that strikes you as odd, then first of all, you should question me. Secondly, you should seek out other information. And so sometimes I'll have students give an example. Um, within modern psychology, experimental psychology, psychoanalysis is seen as a, a, a kind of a pseudoscience that, that, that has been shown to have very uh, questionable effect effectiveness, uh, we don't teach at all except for historical interest. So a student asked me one day, uh, because she was taking a course in sociology, where the, for whatever reason, a uh, professor of sociology is very keen on psychoanalysis, and it told her, don't believe what they tell you in the psychology department. 
so she asked me of this, how come you're telling us this and the, who, who do I believe? My answer was, this is the benefit of the university. You get competing ideas. So you look at what evidence he has to back up what he's saying, and I'll show you the evidence that I have. I can show you all sorts of research reports and analyses, and then decide for yourself. Well, she said, oh, I'd just rather believe you. <laughs> a lot less effort. But, but what she's doing is choosing her authority. And so, so this is the problem that we, we, we're, we're, we all face this. If you, if you read a news report, let me give you an example. Years ago, I read an article in a, in a, in a newspaper, a, a good newspaper. Uh, there was an endocrino endocrinological <laughs> conference on in town. And uh, uh, an endocrinologist, endocrinologist, I said at that time, yep. from Harvard, had said that men, a normal male, if, if he lets a, a baby suckle at his nipple for a few weeks, will produce milk. Really? Now, really, that's what I said to myself. Okay, this is, I checked to see that this really was an endocrinologist. He, he has good credentials. This particular newspaper is one that I have confidence in that tries to get to the truth, but this, this struck me as preposterous. But if it had been in the National Enquirer, I would have just yeah, right. laughed at it. But, so there I am, I'm puzzled. And this is what I try to teach students. When you're, you just rather than accepting it, say, well, he's from Harvard, he's in, he must know. If it, if it doesn't make sense, then check it out. Well, it turns out that under some conditions, this can happen. It's not perhaps as routine as that article made it sound. But it's, it's more complex than that. But it's a matter then of digging, digging through the evidence, going to the literature. And, and even if a person isn't, isn't trained in medicine or whatever, you can certainly seek out other information that, that, that will help you to decide whether that, that particular authority was worth listening to in that case. And in defense of the endocrinologist, he may have said under certain circumstances, yes. but the paper thinks, oh, it You're sounds better right. just to say, because I've been quoted in the paper, sure. it, not totally inaccurately, but to totally different meaning than I said. Yeah. And so they could have just said, well, under certain circumstances it doesn't mean that much. Let's, let's just say it'll happen. Yeah. So, so this is the, the thing, we have to, we, we, we can't reject all authority, and yet we have to, we have to vet it very carefully. And, and that's, that's the trick, and that's what I hope university education does. It helps people get to the point where they can, they can question wisely, rather than, because the danger to critical thinking is where a person says, well, I, I, I know this to be true because it's, my opinion is as good as yours. Well, it shouldn't just be a matter of opinion, it should be a matter of evidence. Oh, right. I agree. Not that you... <laughs> let me move on. I'm, I could go off here, but let me move <laughs> on. Um, let me just ask you, I guess we kind of covered this when I said, how do we decide which beliefs to believe? Um, we decide on an authority. Um, but how... So let me move on to how do what we currently believe uh, affect the incoming beliefs? That's, that's a very important question. Our when we, when we have new information, we automatically vet it against what we already know or think we know. And some of the beliefs we have are, are so basic that, that some psychologists refer to them as primitive beliefs, not in the sense that they're simple necessarily, but that they're, they're fundamental. So, Such as? Well, for example, if you believe that uh, people survive death and the soul lives on, and you believe that all your life, that is such a fundamental belief, it would be very hard for anybody to change it. And you will find what seems to be evidence. You'll, you'll be walking down the street and uh, you'll, you'll think about your grandfather and, and then you'll think, yeah, I should do such and such, my grandfather would want me to do, whatever. And, and you, you, your imagination guides you to do something that grandpa would have told you to do. And later on you say, well, I'm glad, I, I'm glad grandpa guided me that way. Or, uh, or you, you pray, you, 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 uh, you have, feel sick to your stomach and you, 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 you pray to God to make you well and, and next day you're well and you attribute that to God. You might have been well anyway, but, but, but you find lots of what seems to be confirming evidence. And I don't, I don't mean to interrupt you, but there are also several authorities that will tell you that that is true. Sure, absolutely, absolutely. So, so um, if, 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 if that's your authority, if, if, if that's your primitive belief that there is a God and, 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 and life continues after death, then if someone says, uh, I think I saw a ghost, even if you have never seen a ghost, you're much more likely to be interested to believe there might be a ghost 
than someone who doesn't have that, that primitive belief that people survive, right? So, so we always vet those things. So take something more basic. If, uh, if somebody said, uh, and there have been people, they call themselves breatharians, that they don't eat at all. They get all their nourishment just from breathing the air. So they say. So they say. Most of us would say that's nonsense because our primitive belief is that if you don't eat, you die, right? So, so we, we, we naturally screen incoming information against these very basic beliefs. If, uh, if um, you know, if your toaster popped up, toast, I used to have a toaster, the, the toast would pop up about three inches above the toaster and fall over. But if the toaster popped up your toast and it, it just stayed floating in air, your primitive belief is that can't happen. That there's no reason to think that gravity would be suspended in your kitchen. And so you'd be very, are there wires holding it up? Or is someone tricking me? Am I going nuts? What? It would bother you a great deal because it violates that notion that everything unsuspended falls down. So we've had all information. And so uh, if you look even at, um, well, you could even extend it to politics. If, if people believe a, a particular political party uh, is only uh, dedicated to the welfare of the people and that everything they do is, and if they've got that, if that is a very rigid primitive belief, then no matter what that party does, whether it's good or bad, they can interpret it to fit with that primitive belief. They will, they will, they will shift their interpretation of it to be consistent because it's hard, it's hard to violate those beliefs, right? And you can see that getting back to religion. Um, there's, there's no way that if a, a person believes that, uh, you know, grandpa is now in heaven and, and, and guiding her actions, uh, there's no argument in the world that's going to dissuade her. Because, and it's also, you know, it's emotionally imbued as well. Yeah, and there's no, you can't prove. Absolutely, you can't prove it. But it'd be very difficult for her to prove back. So. Yes. But then the belief is also part of a feeling and an emotion. Well, well many beliefs are associated with feelings, for sure. Not, not all of them. I mean, your belief that Albany is the capital of New York probably isn't no. an emotional one. But, uh, but many other beliefs are imbued with emotion. And that makes them all the more difficult to change or, and it makes them usually more resistant to, to disconfirming information. Well, I can see that you would have a physical reaction. Mm -hmm. If something as important as grandpa in heaven, mm -hmm. if you started to challenge that, you would, I know I have challenged my beliefs before and I do have a physical reaction. I sure. don't, it's, it's confusing and yes. a serious belief. It can right. be confusing and yeah. distorting. Exactly. Um, I, let's take this back just a couple, a couple of steps. So I'll defend my mom here. So it, she was right about most things. Mm -hmm. So it was perfectly reasonable for me to accept her Napoleon answer. And with, on the political um, story that you just told, I think I've also read that if people are, uh, if it, they adhere to a specifically one party, they feel better just hearing that person speak. So if the politician gets up and says, well, I, I'm going to propose a bill that will take care of this problem even though it may take 10 years for that to get down the pipe work, people feel better right away just based on that statement. So the belief affects their emotions in a positive way. They think something's been done already. Oh, certainly. Sure. Yes. Wow. So, okay. And this, uh, is, this is why, you know, manipulative leaders who, who can play their followers, can play the crowd right, can come across as being very sincere uh, carrying out the, 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 the go, you know, working towards the goals that the group wants, while all the time doing something else. I mean, so there have been cases in history of, of very manipulative leaders who have been loved by their followers, but in fact have been deceiving their followers all along. But they knew how to play them. Yeah, and people get played seriously. Sure. So, all right, I could go off. I'm going to go on here. Um, and then I guess you've kind of covered one of my questions was, why is it difficult to let go of a belief? Um, which you just covered, but this happens, I'm not the brightest bulb in the bunch, so, and it happens to me that it's difficult to let go of a belief, but I'm kind of confused. A lot of the times, people that I think are very smart will rationalize their beliefs too. Um, and so I was wondering if you could say something about, because you have a new book coming out, right? Yes, that's right. And part of it is about, or at least in your bio, you're interested in how people cling to beliefs without confirming yes. evidence. And so one of my questions was, why is it difficult for people to change their minds when they are faced with overwhelming contradictory evidence, and such as smart people rationalizing false beliefs? And it, it will create, I think the term is cognitive dissonance, where you're holding one, right. you're holding two things separately, but they can't work together. Right. 
Well, I think it goes back to what I said a few moments ago, and that is that if you really strongly uh, believe something, you really, you've got this, this, what I call a primitive belief, and, and you've got evidence that seems to strongly contradict it, then the challenge, and it can happen very quickly, the, the challenge is to find some way of rationalizing the two. Right? If, it's, if, if the belief is so important that it's hard to give up, then you, f you find some way to reject that new information. Uh, perhaps you uh, discredit the authority who, who, who presented the information, or you, you find some way to disregard it. But you do, you, you do something so that your, your shield around that important belief is, is intact. And, uh, you know, even, even, um, even some scientists have, have done that. In fact... Uh, right, one, scientists are not immune from well, this. Well, one famous scientist said that, you know, old ideas in science... Um, I'm sorry, new ideas in science uh, uh, are accepted by the young... And the old ideas die out when the old scientists die with them. Now that's, a, I think, a, a, a bit of an exaggeration. But, uh, but there was a study done back when the first moonshot was done. And, a, and a, uh, I can't remember, it was a psychologist or a sociologist um, got the opinions of a whole number of, uh, of theoretical and experimental physicists as to what, what would the content of these moon rocks be. And, uh, and it, it turned out that the those who were wrong, because some of them were wildly wrong in what they expected in the moon rocks, the experimental physicists who were used to depending primarily on evidence changed their views. The theoretical physicists found some way to rationalize it. Well, these were poor samples or, or whatever, oh. whatever, right? So, um, again, I mean, there's the, we're, none of us are immune from that. But if we, if we uh, I, some people are more data-based and some are more theory-based, right? So the data-based people are more willing to change the, they, their whole style of thinking is one where they're more willing to change if there's new data that's strong, whereas people who are more theory-based stick to their theory. So um, years ago, I, I talked to a, a parapsychologist who'd become a friend, and uh, he asked me, what would it take for you to give up your belief that there's no such thing as extrasensory perception? And I said, well, it wouldn't really be that difficult. I mean, it wouldn't be just one, one study. But if someone could present a phenomenon or an example of extrasensory perception, and it could be repeated by neutral scientists, not even by people like myself who, who are unlikely to believe it initially, but by neutral scientists, before very long, I would, I would be willing to believe it. And in fact, most psychologists would, and they, they would stampede to get the first papers out of this. But I turned to him and I said, what would it take to get you to give up your belief in ESP? He himself was a psychologist. And he thought for a while, and he said, Nothing. You, you, you can't prove it's not there, right? So, so he was theory-based. He, he believes this exists. He hasn't found evidence for it yet. I'm more data-based. <laughs> Say, show me strong data and, and let me see how it's collected. Let me sure, be sure that it's replicable and so forth. And I'm willing to change. So that's data-based versus theory-based. And we all tend to have one of those orientations or the other. But supposedly this other psychologist had run tests and was trying to prove it. He was, that was his whole career. He became his whole a, career was that, but yeah. he hadn't found the data yet. But no. he, he clung to the, well, or he and, or she and, In fact, he was, a, he, he, I should say was, because he's still alive, but he's an example of somebody who um, was willing to say that he couldn't find the data. But it's there. But, but he assumed it was there. Most people in parapsychology are already convinced that they found the data. Okay. Right. So, so, so discussing with them is different. They'll say, "Well, we've got good data," and I'll look at it and they'll say, "This isn't good data." But with him, we both agreed the data was not there to, to support it. But he he believed that it it it, it was there to be found. And the testing just wasn't working. The testing wasn't working. Well, the that's weren't refined enough. I guess I don't know how many tests this person has run, but I guess that's a plausible. Absolutely. If you keep is. testing for it, Absolutely. I mean, there are certain things. You know, and, and this is the thing that in science itself, there are people. At some point, you got to give. I'm sorry. Well, but there's some people in science who have have uh, had what were thought to be nutty ideas, and 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 the world laughed at them. And 50 years later, they were found to be correct. So, for example. But and you know, the parapsychologists use that though. Again. They sure do. They sure do. They sure do. They say, look at you know, look what happened to uh, uh, continental drift, for example. Okay. Yeah. When that idea was introduced, the scientists who introduced it. Uh, had no data. He looked at the, the, the continents and how they look on the globe, and he, 
he theorized that, you know, because of the fit of Africa with America and so forth, that, uh, and he had, he had more to go on than just that. Yeah. But he had no, he could not, he had no way of testing his theory. The, the techniques weren't available for, I don't know what they do, what kind of analysis they do of the Earth. But, um, but people rejected it. it said that's it's a silly idea. 50 years later, it became part of standard science. And when he was asked about this in, in later life, he's, he's, people said, did you feel bitter? I mean, people laughed at you. He said, no. They did the right thing. I had a, an idea that seemed crazy. I had no data to back it up. I was right, but 100 people who have these crazy ideas, 99 of them are probably going to be wrong. And I didn't know I'd be right. I was just pretty sure, but I had no data. So he said, science did the right thing. You can't, science can't turn and look at every sort of crazy idea that comes along. Some of them might be right. Most of them won't be. So, so if someone pursues something doggedly and ends up being right, then we, we see that person as a as a hero in a way, uh -huh. but, but, but most of the people who that end up going nowhere, and some of them are just crackpots. Or they, and they become labeled as such. Yes. Yeah. So, but it's interesting that you knew of at least one parapsychologist that was willing to accept the data wasn't there, but yeah. unlike some, even people that I know who the data isn't there, but they claim it's working, but the, um, the spirit world or ESP is too smart to be fooled. Right. So actually, they use it, I don't know what is the term for this, where they take the, the bad res no results end up being a positive result because it just it proves that they're messing with us. They don't want to be tested. So that's a very interesting. Well, again, that, yes, that's a, you know there are a lot of things in parapsychology that that uh, help defend that, that their belief. For example, a, a basic thing in science is that if you do an experiment and you get results. And if I have the same knowledge or training or ability that you do, uh, I should be able to get the same results. And if, if I don't, then there's something wrong. There's some flaw in the procedure. Or maybe you're cheating or whatever. So this is the whole, the whole purpose of replication. In parapsychology, because two different parapsychologists couldn't get the same results, they named this an effect. They said this is the, the psi experimenter effect, psi being the general term for extrasensory perception. So, so let me, before you go on, so non-replicability is evidence for science. Yeah, because they say what's happening, and they'll explain it by saying that um, it may be that all the results, all the, quote, psychic results, are due to the experimenter, not to the participant. So you ran it, you got, quote, good results, because you were using your psychic energy to make it happen. I run it, I'm skeptical, nothing happens, because... I'm not allowing it to happen. So, so the lack of replicability that becomes evidence of the experimenter effect, as they call it, which then supports their belief, which, which makes no sense, but, but it does to someone who accepts that. Well, it seems that it would make everything very tenuous if, if the um, lack of repl replicability were true. It would also have to extend to almost everything else. So Absolutely. then I couldn't be sure that if I walk left, I'd get to your room. Maybe I have to go right one. Do you understand what I'm saying? Sure. It wouldn't that mess well, up everything right. we I mean, know? It, it deviates from the whole, I mean, you know, civilization over thousands of years, I mean, step by step got to the point where we are now, where we have a method for, for trying to eliminate error. It's never going to be 100% successful. What parapsychologists want to do is to weaken the very controls that, that, that have, have characterized science because they say our subject matter is different. And what's also interesting, if you look at the history of science, going back to the 1700s and so forth, where people believed in spirits and magic and all this kind of stuff, as, as, as contemporary science, modern science started to grow, scientists began to rule out anything that's, that spoke of spirits because that had, had contaminated thinking for so long. And it wasn't to say that these things don't exist, but it was to say that they're not an explanation. So if, oh, okay. if, if uh, you know, an, an egg floats in the air by itself, you don't say, well, I'm, I'm content, the spirit's making it happen. You say, no, no, well, I've got to understand this in, in some, some way that doesn't involve invoking spirits. So, so science sort of pushed the spirit world out, not, not in a, just, just to deny its existence, but to say, that has not ever given us good explanations. Whenever we've ever come to the explanation of any mystery, it's never been magical. It's never been sp the spirits. So um, 
people in parapsychology will say, well, control groups don't work with us because the subject matter is different. So we want you to loosen the controls. We want you to loosen the procedures so that the various controls that were aimed to, to, to eliminate spurious explanations, they would argue, should be weakened to allow their, their approach to flourish. It makes no sense. It would be a step backwards. A for few sure. steps. Yes, yeah, a few steps backwards. Have you participated in um, the evaluation of any of these so-called uh, loose control systems, or you did not bother you? Well, well, I, I've, I've reviewed a whole number of, of studies. Have you been on-site at anything well, and said uh, they're not doing this right, this well, is not control? Uh, uh, not, not exactly, but here's something that, that, that is, is close to what you're talking about. There was a physicist in my university, he's now retired. In the university? Yeah, a physicist who had read some papers by a man at Princeton, Robert John, who had been the Dean of Engineering at Princeton, who um, had become very interested in parapsychology. Uh, sort of a long story behind that. But he was doing some really, um, what, what, what he claimed were very well controlled studies where people would try to use their mind to influence the outcome of a random event generator that involved radioactive decay, blah, 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 it's a long wow. complicated thing. And he produced papers, and there were, there were serious methodological problems with, with this research of his. You looked into the research and yes. found it yourself? Yes, in fact, I did an extensive review of it. Um, so there were real problems with it. But anyway, uh, because John was a physicist, and because this, this, uh, this chap at my university was a physicist, he, he, he trusted physicists more than he trusted psychologists. And he wanted to replicate what was being done at Princeton. And so he called me up. I, hadn't, I didn't know him at that time, but he said, uh, look, I know you're, you've criticized John's work. You're criticizing everybody's work. I want to show you the way I'm going to do this, and I want your criticisms in advance so oh. I can address them in advance. So we could set the study up correctly. Okay. So I said, fine. So I, we, we met a number of times, and there were things that he was going to do. I said, no, that's, that's going to contaminate it. So he set up what, in my opinion, was a good study. And, but I had to say to him, look, uh, this doesn't rule out, you know, one experiment by itself can still have flaws that, that I haven't noticed, you haven't noticed, but, but at least on paper, this, this looks absolutely appropriate to me. So he did it that way, and he got no results. And he did it again, and he got no results. And this physicist from Princeton came up and uh, looked at his work and said, well, with, with, with these parapsychological things, it's not like regular science. You've got you've to keep... This is a physicist saying this. Yes, you've got to keep working at this. So, so uh, this man did, and did it a number of times. He then took his apparatus, went down to Princeton, let them get involved, got no results at all. In fact, he never got any results suggestive of anything paranormal. And here's the interesting thing. The people who at Princeton originally were quite excited about this. Here's a physicist at another university who's really interested in our research. By the time it was all over, what was being said um, about him was that he didn't do it right. He didn't know what he was doing. It doesn't count. Oh. Right? So there's an example of somebody who really tried, and, and he was very enthusiastic. He thought there's really something going on here that, that he would help prove existed. And when he found no evidence of it, um, he became disillusioned. But he was also very saddened by the response of the people who had been so excited about him getting involved. They tried to tarnish him. Well, they, As opposed to just saying, well, yeah, I guess we made a mistake yeah. here. They, they, uh, what, what, uh, but again, it makes sense, doesn't it, that, that if you really believe in something... Well, they're married to the belief. And, and, and someone has disappointed you by not finding it, it's hard to say, well, I guess he's right, there is nothing. <laughs> we, we, we've, we've been out in the public talking about this research. It's, it's, it, they're not going to abandon that belief. So what is the explanation? It, it must be that... He didn't do it right in some way. He, 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 right? And I don't think that they wanted to put him down as an individual. I mean, they didn't take sort of... Uh, okay, I understand, yeah. They didn't insult him as a... But they said, he, good. you know, he, he didn't know what he's doing. There are two issues that I have to get sidetracked with here. One is I would think that the person, the physicist at Princeton, the dean or whoever's in charge of that department might want to say, listen, we've got to move on from this because this is costing a lot of money and it's obviously not working. And the other thing is... It's interesting that two physicists couldn't design their own studies well, without consulting. Problem. Not that it's bad to consult someone like you, but a, a scientist should know how to... But you see, here's the problem. 
physicists don't work with people. They work with, they work with subject matter that doesn't lie, that doesn't, that doesn't trick them. Uh, oh, so this, there, there, there were uh, people involved in this? Well, they, were, they, were studying, they were studying the, the, the ability of people, uh, of, of okay. participants right. to, con to, to make fluids matter, right? Oh, right, yeah. right? Okay. Oh, right and, the radioactive decay. Yeah, and, and so physicists, well, a couple of things. First of all, uh, physicists often tend to think that, I mean, they're the true scientists and that they probably don't need guidance from anybody else. I mean, there tends to be a bit of, of, of um, amongst many physicists, that, that sense, at least amongst people I've met. I don't mean that in a bad way. It just means that, that physics is extremely successful science. And, uh, um, but the, the confidence they have in doing the research uh, misguides them when they come to working with people. Because when you're dealing with human beings, it's a very different matter. You, you've, you've got all kinds of subtle influences that can, that can change people's behavior. You've got all kinds of opportunities for fraud that you, you wouldn't get when you're studying atoms and molecules, right? So, um, so that's why when, when, uh, when I was asked to give my criticisms in advance to the physicists of my university, made sure that the various controls you need in dealing with human subjects were in place so that um, if, if they were trying to deceive, they would be unlikely they could get away with it. But more, more, more than that, that there weren't subtle influences that were, influ that were leading the, the, the participants in the experiment to act in ways that were in line with what the experimenter hoped. Just out of curiosity, when did you were you able to review the final product of the fail? Did the did the participants try to deceive? No, it wasn't. It wasn't that. No, like, okay. no. In that in that final, I mean, there was no opportunity for them to deceive. You know that was that, and that's the point that you want to you want to rule that out. Whereas in the Princeton studies, there was. Oh, interesting. And and a glaring opportunity to deceive. Oh. So so and that was pointed out. Uh, in, in my reviews and in other people's reviews as well, but the the person running it was so convinced that he could trust th these people. They, why why would they deceive him? And that was yeah. He, he, so he he it never occurred to him that he should put in some kind of control. But anyway, it, it uh, to to his dying day, he he really believed that he had discovered something really important. He never he never gave up on that belief. Oh. And he left a legacy. People still well. The, his lab closed down. There's still people that work with him who are doing parapsychological research. Huh. Interesting. Um, I'm going to move back to belief and emotion because right. I have uh, something that I wanted to ask you specifically. Um, and the question I had was, how do beliefs affect emotions? But what I mean by that is a belief. I have a few examples of this. Maybe they're too mundane, but you know, if you if you form a false belief, it can still have serious consequences. Certainly. So there's something simple like if I lose my wallet, I'm anxious, but then I find it on the table. It takes a while for the anxiety to right. dissipate. Um, there are other examples such as if you believe the creator of the universe wants you to throw gay people off buildings, that you should do that. Right. And if you really believe it. It's rational to act. I, right. I hesitate to say it, but it's rational to act if you really believe that. There's one other example I saw recently in a YouTube video, which is a great resource, where some martial arts master claimed that he could defeat people just without touching them. All right. And he had a class that believed this, and I say they believed it, because he would do something and they would fall down and people would rush to their aid. Um, and they would take serious falls. And then Another martial artist said, this is baloney. I'm going to go in there. He won't defeat me. So the real martial, not, I shouldn't say the real one, but the, the martial artist went in. They sparred. He really took this force guy down. Um, so it became apparent that there's nothing to his, whatever he was doing. Right. But my question about that is his students, I don't think they were faking it. They really believed that he was shooting something at them because they, they took falls, they would get up, they'd, you know, they would look distraught, their friends would come. Their belief was really affecting them. Can you say anything about I don't even know what my question is here. Well, well, first of all, yeah, I'm always a little cautious about these clips. You think because, it was faked? Well, it could be. It could be staged. But let's, let's, let's assume that it wasn't staged. 
suggestibility is very powerful. So, you know, one of the standards, you know, what, what people call hypnosis is really just uh, suggestibility. People, because everyone has heard about hypnosis and they believe that hypnotists can, in fact, sort of take over your mind and make you do things, it makes them susceptible to doing what the hypnotist tells them to do, even though they don't need to. But they, they, if they really believe it, they'll do it. So, but one of, the, one of the very simple tests to see how suggestible people are and how prone they would be to follow the hypnotist's suggestion is to have a person stand facing the wall, sort of toes to the wall, and, and then uh, if you stand behind, put your, your, your fingers on the person's temples and, and simply say, listen, in a few moments you're going to start to feel yourself falling backwards. And I'm here to catch you, but you're going to start falling backwards. Uh, if you do that with a dozen people, three or four of them will fall. They'll fall into your arms. And you'll ask them, why do that? They say, well, I, I, I didn't want to fall, but I, that's suggestibility. Now, that's a very simple example of it. But, but two things are important. One, people think that this happened beyond their control. And two, it doesn't happen with everybody. That, 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 that some people are more suggestible than others. And so um, people who do uh, acts of, on stage, hypnotists, they will, they will select people. Yes, they'll I've do some seen them. They get 20 people up there and they'll, they'll go, you, why don't you sit yeah, down, I'll take you. They'll pick you, the you ones sit. that are, you know, I remember when I was Interesting. I, oh. an undergraduate, I once uh, went on the stage of the famous uh, hypnotist Ravine. Ravine the impossibilist. He, he did hypnosis and other things. And I didn't believe in any of this stuff, of course. I mean, I, I, didn't, I knew enough about hypnosis that I knew it was it's just suggestion. But I thought, well, gee, it'd be interesting to get up there on stage, see what he does. So he got about 40 people from the audience. And this was new to me. I'd, I'd never seen a hyp hypnotic induction before. But what he did, he said, OK, close your hands together like that. And now in a moment, he said in a very deep voice, you won't be able to pull them apart. And I thought, Mike, I, I can't get them apart. Well, if you close your hands together, you have to spread your fingers to get them apart. If anybody does that, the knuckles lock. Now, n normally, you, you know you've locked them, so you just un unlock them. But if someone is saying, you can't get them apart, I realized I was suggestible, okay. and, it, and it really freaked me out at the time. I was I know, 19 years old, and I, and I sort of blinked and deliberately opened my hands and got off stage. I thought, oh, this is really freaky stuff. got me really interested in hypnosis, but it's just suggestion. And so going back to your example uh, of these people falling over, they, if they are suggestible, if they've seen other people doing this, then it's easy to come to believe, for some people are suggestible, that there is this power. It, it's, I still tend to be a bit skeptical. It depends how much they're thrown backwards. If they're, if they're, if they're sort of collapsing, it's one thing. All if these they, guys are doing like backflip. Yeah, that's. Uh, I think, I can't uh, quite recall. It's a, it, it may, be a, it may be staged. Some of them were just yeah. collapsing in a heap. Right. But I can see now, though, if the, mixed, if the martial artist expert was aware of what you were talking about, suggestibility, he could glean a class oh, sure. from a hundred people, absolutely, and say, "Oh, I'll take these ten in my mm -hmm. class," yeah. or a cult leader or whomever. Um, I want to wrap up here. I know you're busy, so, but I, you just said something that I had one question about. Where you said you went to the hypnotist act, but of course you didn't believe. Right. So, um, was there? Did you? Was there a time when you? were more of a believer in certain things and you worked your way out of it? Or have you oh, always well, been naturally... Well, no, no, I was, I was brought up by a, a very religious mother. I was very religious until I was probably 16 or 17 or 18. May I ask which religion? Uh, uh, Protestantism. Pro okay, so they, you did the whole thing in your teens? And yeah, then... yeah. But my father, my mother always said he was religious, but I never saw any signs of it. He, he never objected to religion. You know, I went to Sunday school every, every week. He, he never criticized religion. But my mother would say grace at the table, and my father would sit with his eyes open. I used to think that was odd. <laughs> but he, he never once said a critical thing. And, uh, but it always struck me kind of odd. Here's my mother. Religion is central to her life. Here's my father. Doesn't knock it, but no indication at all. And I'd say to my mother sometimes, because I couldn't ask my father this directly. Uh, she said, oh, yeah, he's, he's religious in his own way, whatever that meant. But, but so, yeah, when I, was, uh, when I started university, it, it, for me, it was a painful, well, I don't want to exaggerate it too much, but it was difficult over a period of a couple of years to give up my belief. And, it's disturbing, and, I will and, tell you that. And what irritates me to this day is that uh, 
I think it's very easy if you're brought up in that belief to stick with it. It's relatively easy. And so when I meet born again Christians who tell me, well, you know, you say you're religious and now you're not, you never had the true faith. It's, it's easy to be an, an, a non believer. I say, no, it's, it's very difficult <laughs> to go from being a believer to being a non believer. And, and at least in my case, and other people I've talked to the same thing, that you're, you're, you're taught these, these basic beliefs, you're taught to feel guilty if you question them even. I mean, I can remember when I was, uh, probably this happened to a lot of people, five or six, talked to my very religious aunt. I said, how come in the Bible, there's Adam and Eve, and there's Cain and Abel. So yeah, four people, right? Cain kills Abel, right? Three people. Then he goes and gets married. Who does he marry? My aunt got very upset at me. Don't you ever ask these questions. Yeah, the Lord works questions. in strange ways, and you accept this in faith. <gasps> oh, okay, don't question. And that's, of course, the thing about, about dogmatic belief. You don't question. And if you do question, it's easy to feel guilty about it. And that's what made it so hard for me because in some ways it made no sense. And yet even thinking about it was, right? Well, it's interesting you mentioned that because one of the stories I read that was odd, we've all heard about Sodom and Gomorrah. Right. They, the three, I can't remember all the names, but it's a lot that escapes, right? right? With his wife and two daughters, his wife turns around, pillar of salt. Right. So now it's just him and his two daughters. And his daughters become fearful that, I'm sorry, his daughters become fearful that they won't have children. Right. So they get, the story kind of ended when I was a kid, it ended at the pillar of salt, right. which was a lesson in itself, don't question God or whatever. But if you read more, his daughters get him drunk and they have sex with him so they can have children. And then they go off to become the Moabites, I think, or the Moabs or something. But there's nothing after that says, and this was wrong, don't <laughs> do, and I, I'm thinking, this is just, this is, Weird. Yes, yes. This is you got to follow the rest of the story and yeah. think something's not right here. Yeah. Not only because of the incestuous part of it, but there's nothing saying so. Don't don't get your father drunk and right. Yeah. Um, I'm glad that's a question I didn't ask though. Right. Um, I want to talk. I, we didn't even mention the books that you've written. Let me grab one of them here, which I. Oh, here it is. So I think this is an excellent book. Not that you care about my opinion, but. Well, thank you. Of course, I care about your opinion. Parapsychology, science, or magic. It's. This is an old copy right. because it's not in print now, but you can find it, really some excellent information on psychology of belief, experience of belief, and I found the, um, some of this, uh, the information on the testing really great in this. And you do have a new book coming out. Yes. Which is called? Belief. That's the simple, that's it? It's got a subtitle. Um, I can never remember what the subtitle is because the publishers right. chose it. Uh, why it is that our beliefs are so compelling and, and, and why it's so hard to change them, something like that. Anyway, the, the major title is Belief. Was this a long project? A long, yeah, it took me years to write it. Did you write it through your affiliation with the university and all the, some of well, these studies that you've part, done? Well, part of it is based on, uh, I teach a course that uh, addresses these topics, and, and so part of it comes from that, uh, not, not the material itself, but obviously, you know, the, the flow of ideas. So I talk about you know, what does it mean to believe? Some of the questions you've asked me, what does it mean to believe? How do philosophers look at it? How do psychologists look at it? Where do beliefs come from? What's the role of authority? But then I get into things as well, such as our, our beliefs about our bodies and, and how um, we, we can easily imagine ourselves being sick when we're not, or we can think that we're not sick when we are. We can, you know, our minds can distort information coming from our bodies, talk about, uh, how we, we perceive the world itself, how, how our memory is subject to so many vulnerabilities, and yet the way we define ourselves is in terms of our memories. You know, if you ask someone who they are, well, I, I'm a student, I'm this, I'm that, but that's, that's all coming from memory. But memory is very fragile in some situations. Talk about how, how basic learning occurs. Um, um, and then ultimately I get into things such as uh, beliefs in, in strange phenomena, again, whether it's UFOs or uh, ESP or, or whatever. So I'll cover this large gamut of belief. Wow. I look forward to reading it. Well, I hope it's, I hope it's uh, interesting. <laughs> 502 Conversations. I'm Brian Kirby. My guest today has been Dr. James Alcock from York University, Toronto. Right. Thank you very much. I appreciate Thank this you. greatly. You're welcome.